Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, episode 62, where three, well, two cycling nerds this time and a pro uh, discussed what's been happening in the world of cycling. And I'm delighted to introduce Jack Burke to the podcast and also Patrick Blake as well. We'll be dissecting what's been happening here. The, well, some people say this is the holy week of cycling in terms of the Tour of Flanders. But uh, yeah, welcome to you both. I don't know why I'm saying welcome, but we're all welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a crazy week. I must admit, I haven't actually watched Flanders live today. I've been out, which is kind of sacrilegious for me. <laughs> but I have I've re-watched it. Uh, from the kind of Twitter sphere, did I miss much? People are saying that it wasn't a huge exciting race. Do you, do you think that's a fair assessment? Or... So I don't want them to make the race shorter. I, I love having like these classics that are big and long. And I, any of the people that say we need to just make all bike races like 120 kilometers, I completely say against that. However, I do think now that cycling is changing, these super long and just like brutally hard races are going to become more boring because the start of the race and like the, the whole beginning part of the race, there's no pacing. It's so aggressive now that it's almost like the idea of like if an airplane, like things get exaggerated out so much by the end of the race. So mo- almost everybody's completely out of gas with 40K to go. And it's just like one or two guys. If you make a mistake with your fueling or whatever, and you miss like a bottler, like everything just gets exaggerated based on the race being so long. Like you watch today's race, Vanderpool, okay, he was tired crossing the line, but he was still going a lot stronger than all the dead bodies for the last 40K. Like guys were completely dead with 40k left in the race and then it becomes a little bit more boring where yeah we just watched a 45 kilometer time trial at the end of the race today fastest ever edition and it keeps they keep breaking the record so it's i am like what is going on here well it's because like the now how cycling has changed where guys are just taking in so many carbs like the analogy i give is like we just made the gas lines to the end just so big because guys are taking in so many carbs like 120 grams of carbs an hour through like that you look at their pockets there's no gels or anything in their pockets anymore because everybody's just taking these super mixes in their bottles so you can run the engine on the red line the whole time there's no holding back so it's just like wide open throttles from the very beginning like the neutral zone is no longer a safe way to get out of town. It's just like all the biggest engines in the world doing burnouts and just getting ready to launch as soon as the race kicks off. And my point being, it's like when the race is 280 kilometers or 270 kilometers in Flanders, like everybody's just dead by the time there's 40K to go because no one's holding back anymore. And so when you have like one or two guys, like if you screw up your fueling strategy a little bit when the stakes are that high, it just gets exaggerated that much. You can't really recover. And you end up crawling for the last 40K. Like you look at Jorgensen. Like he, I don't, where did he finish at the end? Like ride of the day, unbelievable ride on great form. He just went backwards. And he was the one that was the closest to being able to follow MVDP on the Koppenberg, I think it was, where he went off at 45K to go. He was the only one that was even close. And then he just like parachute open. And ran out of gas. He probably also sat up a bit once he was out of contention, but thirty first yeah. apparently. Uh, and unfortunately, he lost the battle of the Mateos as well as Quentin finished nineteenth. Oh darn! Oh. He was really going for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what did you? Know, what did you guys make of the race? I mean, much of Anapol, like we've been talking about, absolutely brutally attacking as well. A lot of riders behind him couldn't even couldn't even climb the, the hill on their bike. They had to get off. I was going into the race already not massively invested because there was no wow. And so I think the inevitability of Vanderpool's victory was kind of exemplified. It's also just a bit like, oh, you know. When I saw a Vanderpool with one, I was like, wow. Who saw that one coming? I don't know. Like Pedersen had a ball on Wednesday. So it felt like there was never really any competition to be most interesting part was probably the wet weather. Like we haven't seen a wet edition as bland as in I can't think of one which has been like that wet. I can see like this there's been like points where it's been down, like Terpstra's victory. I remember him being a bit muddy. But yeah, I don't know. I think that it, it was a it was an okay edition. But I think that the absence of wow really showed in this race because Vanderpool just soloing with 45 k's to go. It did make the 
the victory a little bit like, oh, well, we already know who's won with an hour of racing left to go. I wasn't actually so down on it, like going into the race, because I was curious to see like how the other teams were going to play their tactics with it. I think like, okay, what's the takeaway from the race? Like, what are the teams thinking after? I think Alpecin is pretty stoked right now because all the talk going in was like, okay, they have the favorite, but do they have a strong enough team to control the middle part of the race? And they played it perfectly. Like tactics wise, they nailed it. Like I think they, they made a lot of other teams look silly doing that as far as, and like proving that they could do it. So I think they're stoked leaving this race. I was curious to see, like, how does Yumbo try to win without the big super favorite then? Because, like, they don't have anybody that can go toe-to-toe with MVDP, like, when the race winning move goes. They don't have it, and so they have to be a little bit more tactical with using numbers. And I think they probably, on paper, they probably still had the strongest team going into this race. If you look at the rosters, the depth of their roster... Everyone was claiming that they had the strongest team. Little Trek was saying, we have the strongest now, despite losing Stoven and... Alex Kirsch, UAE, was saying we have the strongest team despite not having Pogacar. But Alpazin wasn't actually saying it. We just They just said we have the favorite. Uh, come at us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Going back to UAE, even though, I mean, obviously they got pull it off the podium because Michael Matthews couldn't sprint in a straight line, which is probably fair because he's probably like hyperglycemic at that point. Just like seeing stars. But didn't they get like third, fourth, and fifth today? Something like that? Yeah, classic. How many UCI UAE. points is that? A, a lot, I think, especially when it's a one day race. There's Morgado, a Neo Pro finishing fifth. Yeah. That's pretty incredible, no? With the Umbo not even in the top 10 picture, like, those teams seem to really enjoy the UCI rankings, even if spectators don't enjoy it too much. They'd probably see that as a big victory today. They probably got over a thousand UCI points, which is a nice little subheading. Kind of on the end of the day. You think um, UAE's happy about that? I think they'll, I think they'll be happy and also getting a podium today. I don't think they could have got more than, than third place today. Maybe they could have got second. I think UAE are happy. happy. Yeah. Do you I think they honestly think thought they were winning? Like, I don't think well, they... Well, I think any team that, that, like, gets that many riders in the top, whatever, seven, they're going to be pissed being like, okay, like, we would rather had, like, one guy contending for the win... They've all, they always get criticized for this, and I never noticed it until today. Like, I, I was just like, I, I never paid any attention to it, where people would be like, when Pogachar is not there, he, the criticism they get is that the team is a disaster and like nobody's working together and everybody's just going for their own results when Poggy's not there. And that's why they end up finishing second, third, fourth, fifth instead of first. I was like, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's something to this. They were in like that third group. So they, we had the. The duo. Who was the duo? There was two riders out in front. Yeah. Then there was that group with four UAE riders and they weren't really committing to it. It was like, what? And then like the other riders in that group were like, yeah, sure, we'll do a turn. This team has four riders. Put them on the front. Yeah. Uh That didn't make sense. I mean, I I don't know how they would have like contended to win the race. I mean, other than basically taking Jumbo's tactic of like trying to one two guys. Like that's how Jumbo's won races, and that's how I thought they were going to do it, and I think that's what they tried to do. They just ran out of legs in the end of it. But, and, like, they had some bad luck going into it. Like, they were missing a lot of guys. Van Barl had some bad luck with crashes and getting caught out earlier in the race, so he was spending bullets early. I don't think he was feeling well as well. I think he came in a bit sick. So I, I don't think they had all the horsepower coming into the race, but they're usually better at executing that tactic, and I think UAE probably had the legs and didn't execute the tactic as well. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair assessment on that. Yeah, I agree. But anyways, uh, much of Wonderful winning. We can talk about that. Three victories. So many uh, riders haven't done that. He's part of this elite club now. So if he wins next year, he's going to be the only one who's on four. But in terms of Paro Bay is coming up. And yeah, I don't know if you're excited about this. Well, much of Wonderful winning in the rainbow jersey anyway. I wouldn't care. I would love it. If he went to the, in a small crate somewhere in in a Brugge, that would be nice. But in terms of this Paro Bay, do you think he's still the favorite? His teammate, Jasper Phillips, and he's also looking to win that. So is Mate Moric. He came out and said he wants to win it. They can't all win. Is he the favorite or is there someone else? I think it's hard to pick a favorite out of that, man. I would have expected Mohoric. I would have expected more out of Mohoric today, but you never really saw him. He didn't finish as well. I think he crashed a at some point, like a uh, soft crash, but not 
crush, crush. He was already at a position. I remember this crash and seeing it, but it's like he was already at the back. You know, like, okay. I like he was actually one of like my dark horses for the race. I was thinking like, okay, he could do really well here. I was really hoping for something from him, but I would have assumed like this more than Roubaix. I mean, everybody can have their off day, but yeah, I, who yeah. do you pick other than Vanderpool? Oh, well, let's think the other person who can beat Vanderpools. But let's see. Yeah, you just time to win there, and then it's a sprint in the in the yeah. Roubaix Velodrome. It's not a rivalry between them, but yeah, when you've got two big riders who both want to win it on the same team, that's probably where the only difficulty can arise. Because but I do think with Roubaix has this tendency to really throw up some odd riders like Dillier, Aaron Pollitt, have been some real kind of odd ones. That really wet one where Gamish was up there as well, and Cole Bradley won it. You know, Cole Bradley would beat up all fair and square that day. So you, you can get a slightly more weird result in Roubaix, which I think does provide a bit of optimism towards the race not just going to the way of Vanderpool. Just because it's flatter, and I think that that levels it just a little bit. Quite literally, because there is literally you no know, hill, so it does level up. You get what I mean? Uh, so there's just a bit more draft going on. It's not just Van der Poel gets on the Passberg and just goes, all right, see you guys. Because you, you can't do the one minute what the kilo that I can. So I'm just going to hit you all off my wheel and off I go. I'm trying to think of some dark horses to throw into the mix. More Pollard. Pollard, yeah. Pollard had a good ride today. today. The other two ones that I hope come good are, yes, Mads Pedersen, because he crashed. And mm-hmm. he was in that big crash as well. Didn't hit the deck as hard as everybody else, but still, that's not going to feel good. And he was strong today. Whether he spent the bullets a little too early or not, it's he, he was strong what to be able to go that? today. Like, honestly. I mean, the guy's clearly trying anything he wants, but I feel like he gets in this position so often, like where he does something like that, and then the big favorites come up to him, and you just see the photo, and you see everybody's got the grimace on, and Pedersen's is just so much worse. Like he's just hurt himself so much more, and this he is trying so hard to like be matching Vanderpool, Van Art, and Pogachar, and he's just like the the one that's got to try because he's not as explosive, or it's, he can't. I don't know. It's he he has to try to win it the the harder way. Well, you finished fourth there last year, so I mean, if he does recover in the next week, yeah, for sure, you could he like could? still there, obviously. Or Van Barl. I really hope, I, I hope I it's like, well, if I don't know what his scenario is right now. Like people were saying like, oh, maybe he's a little bit off. Maybe he's been a bit sick or something like that. Like how bad is it? If it's not that bad, he could turn around in a couple of days, and, like suddenly be fresh, suddenly be flying. Whole team's around him. Like if he's good, that that would be a great one to have. Your former yeah. teammate, Matteo Jorgensen or wow. Laporte is also down on the start list, even though he hasn't been part of quite a lot of races now. Yeah. Dylan Twins had a great race today. I just can't trust the ball. Whatever's going on with him, I just don't think that he can have had a decent enough kind of training block or, or like this this whole preparation for this Roubaix is just going to be disrupted. There's no way that his preparation can be as good as Van der Poel's. Is how I see it. But then again, you don't know guys how guys are going to react from this weekend. There might be with the rain stuff, people might. I've got might get like a little bit of illness off of this race just because they've gone so hard and you never know just random little illnesses pop up they always happen in the pre-race interviews like before we it's like oh you know i got ill after <laughs> after we waited well, after one of my tanks i could have used that information you know a few days ago but i kind of want to see like magnus sheffield he finished him in top 10 today. Um, but there was only 21. But that's just like another cool name to be throwing into the mix. Like. That was a good one because he was getting a lot, he's been getting a lot of criticism. Mean, he does crash a lot, but, but he's been getting a lot of criticism for that. And so to see him actually like together on Flanders, that's a really nice one to see. Josh Charling's also down for the start start in uh, right. Pyro Bay. And he finished 17th in Rube- uh, in Flanders. So clearly good legs. He does have good legs. He's all right in Dwarf's door as well. So. There's clearly something good going on there, I think. And, I mean, strange things have happened. We saw Gamma do really well last year in Rubai after not really... Yeah, they were too good in the S-Pass version, but kind of coming a bit out of nowhere. So there's no reason why Sparling couldn't post the top 10, even if he is really young, but form is form. And he's clearly, he's clearly got it at the moment. So 
as long as he's come out of his race pretty unscathed and feeling good, I don't see any reason why Arling could be somewhere like 10 through to 8 or something like that. Don't you I think much in Wonderful in this by completely putting that B star, like your plan B in the break in a Roubaix. Yeah. You know that Roubaix break is so famous for staying away. Yeah, but Alperson probably puts someone in that break as well. Who's that? Who are they putting there? Jasper Philipson? Vermeersh? Vermeersh? Oh, yeah, okay. He was yeah. good. Yeah. He had a good one today. Axel or Rons, maybe, as well? Yeah. He, he exactly. looked pretty good. Yeah, it's yeah. like you said, Jack. Like, them marking all the moves and sandbagging everything, and then it was just ready for Machu to just launch up. And they use their tactics so much more than their legs today. And that's not to take away from any of them at all, but it's just like they don't have any other, like, Plan B superstars, and they have the out and out favorite, where it's everybody else against them, and they're expected to do all the work. And they made other teams do the work by playing their tactics amazingly well. I think yeah. Jorgensen will take a lot of confidence going into Roubaix because it like there was a lot of pressure and a lot of hype going on him in Flanders, and he lived up to it. Like all people are going to remember from this is the scene going up the Hoppenberg, is it where everybody's falling off their bikes? And he's the only one that's even close to Vanderpool. It's Vanderpool, five meters, Teo, and then, okay, the gap started to go out. But then the gap behind was way more. He was the only one that was even close. And all the pressure was on him. It's not like he was a dark horse that nobody was expecting. Everybody was looking to him, and he lived up to it. Now he can go into Roubaix. He can relax. We don't have all the pressure on us. (laughs) <laughs> well it's not the pressure the pressure is not as much on his shoulders he lived up to it in flanders it's everybody understands it's like look our team's been decimated we don't have all the superstars that we're supposed to have he can go on and be like you know what i've had an amazing year already so far he can <laughs> sit up shop for the rest of the season now and be like one perry nice like had a great season already and once it lost a while as well yeah not yeah. a bad race either i mean that crash in dwarsto we might as well turn back to that uh, we didn't really discuss it, uh, Matteo Jorgensen winning it, but a horrendous crash. Uh, I'm not quite sure who was at fault. I saw something hovering around that T. Spanut, uh took the blame or something like that. But that aside, what does Wout Van Aert do now for the rest of the season? I think he's going to be great in the Giro. I think, well, uh, is he down for the Giro? I'm not sure he is. He, yeah, well, he's supposed to do the Giro. Like, that's been the whole big plan is, like, he was supposed to do the Giro. I don't think they're going to take him out. I think, like, people... I Obviously, we don't know the extent of his injuries and stuff. I think it's a broken sternum, some broken ribs, and a broken collarbone. The extent of that obviously matters a lot. But if it's not that bad, like, you can train with broken ribs and whatnot. Like, I'm saying in a week or so, if the breaks aren't that bad, like, he can maybe be on a trainer a little bit this week. Within a week, he's back to like solid training on a trainer. You don't know, like, if he has surgery on the collarbone. It's, you know, he's got so much of an amazing buildup behind him already. Okay. Flanders is gone. Roubaix is gone. I, maybe it makes him a little bit fresher going into the Giro. I think he's going to do great at the Giro. I don't know if he's going to be poggy, but I do think he could have an amazing Giro if the, the injuries aren't that bad, but we obviously don't know how bad they are. I mean, it's, I think it's seven broken ribs, a broken sternum, and a broken collarbone. It's pretty bad by any standard, but in cycling terms, can you get on? It's not a broken femur, right? Like he'll be on the bike on the trainer in a week. It wouldn't surprise me. If, if the injuries were bad, whether this one's by or whether they go, ah, oh, yeah, well, let's just send it to the tour again in support of you. And this is all just one big conspiracy theory. Each but they actually took him down on purpose because they actually just want wow at the tour. They're like, well, we're we're him. <laughs> yeah. We're just like, no, well, we're going with real hot takes here. <laughs> yeah, this is an absolute tinfoil hat conspiracy theory from a moment. I don't know. I, I, I think. He should still be able to get to the Giro. But I think it's a fairly that he'd get set to at all. But then there's the Olympics, which he wants to do well in. And that does those two things don't seem to be working too well. Like not a lot of people seem to be favoring the or going into the Olympics uh, route. Yeah. What do you, who doesn't favor that? I've always heard a lot of people really love that. Like the tour is the best prep for the Olympics for yeah, but a lot of guys. Like, yeah. Even though it's the same country, obviously Nice and Paris aren't that close, but yes. but like is but like people will drop out of the tour early 
That is not with soft food against this one. I can remember. Thank you. Yeah, I think he said like the first week or something like that. But yeah, there is rumors that he's even skipping the tour. So all this for the Olympics. So I mean, yeah. Jack doesn't agree with this. So no, it's just I, I like think... rumors. Rob is skipping it. I'm skipping the tour to get ready for the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I, I haven't heard those rumors. And like all the talk I've ever heard in like Pat from past Olympic games is like guys love using the tour as like the last big like super compensation pl- or like big block to get you ready like to get that speed in your legs for the olympics if you recover like it depends like some guys come out of the the grand tours and they're dead other guys seem to like have the best legs of their life two weeks later i think this injury for Wout, yeah it sucks for flanders and roubaix it might be the best thing for him for the rest of the season like if he goes and wins a gold medal at the olympics yeah, who's yeah. going to remember this, right? He can go win yeah. Roubaix next year. Well, Macho probably will win it next year as well. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's true. But Olympics is every four years. doesn't come around very often. Pro Cycling Stats says that he's got nothing on the program now until the Olympic Games and then the World Test Final. Yeah, that's it. They've well, taken him on. off the Giro list. Well, yeah, well, he's, he's not, not getting on the Giro list. He's getting that money. They're paying him. He's showing up. Yeah, they must be paying a fortune for this. Yeah, <laughs> he's showing up for that. <laughs> he wants that Italian money. Yeah, yeah. Something has to pay for his Rolexes. <laughs> uh, but okay, okay. We're saying hypothetically he's still going to the Giro, and yeah. the Giro to the Olympics. That's a massive hole. Hmm. Well, I don't know, man. I I don't even know if this stuff is like even real anymore. Like, I'm gonna be like, okay, the Giro Tour double is still like no one's done it since Pantani. Who knows? Pogachar might do it this year, but like the whole might do the Triple Crown. He he might. Like, look at how racing has changed. How much like guys are recovering so much better now. Like, I think the old rules don't apply. Like the idea of like if you do the Giro, you're not gonna be good in the summer for the Olympics. It's like. Man, take a week off, yeah. go to altitude camp. I think they can do it. I don't think that really applies anymore. Yeah, like, I, mean, I agree. Maybe if you completely kill your, like if you have some terrible crashes in the Giro and you destroy your body just trying to finish, yeah, maybe. But Wout's not going to do that. I mean, Tom Scorch, he was, uh, there was an interview I did with him on the Cycling Dane Extra channel. And it counts because it's in this week, so I can apply it. And he said that Lidl Trek, the amount of money that they've got from Lidl, that this was the first time he's been at an altitude camp with the team. So, what, Tom's? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that that's yeah. very shocking to hear. No wonder but, he's flying now. Yeah. Well, the other thing, it's like yeah. all these guys do their own altitude camps as well. Mm. Like it's the the you talk to Jorgensen, for example. Like he was spending a ton of his own money to like buy his own ketones and stuff like that on Mobistar and just like investing so much into doing like all the yeah on Mobistar yeah for sure he was he was spending a lot of his own money to buy this stuff on Mobistar I hope I'm allowed to say that (laughs) like like, he was investing a lot of his own money to like do everything properly on Mobistar and like you gotta admire the guy for like investing in himself like that whether like doing all these crazy things that was not in the team budget he took out of his own pocket to do it that got him a contract on Jumbo. And now I'm sure it's he's made it all the money back and now they're doing it for him. And the other thing is I was talking to uh, Rihanna Marcus, who's superstar on the women's Jumbo team. I had her on the podcast and I asked her about uh, like Jumbo, like first tell me about the the altitude protocol on Jumbo. Or sorry, uh, Lisa, Visma Lisa bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. don't Jumbo. worry. We've Bye already back. converted that offense like 17 <laughs> times in this podcast already. Wow well, isn't going to be very happy because Wow was the one who went out and told all podcasters how to say the name properly. And Visma I Lisa think... bike, right? Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. It's so bad. But anyways, uh, she like I asked her about ketones and she was saying, it's like, well, yes, we have them, but one, it's, it doesn't make the biggest difference and they don't give it to all the riders. It's only to the riders where it's like once you've done the basics and you're really showing that you're at, it's not like they just hand them out freely. It's if you're, you've are you committed and you've shown that you know how to do all the basic stuff really well, that's the last little bit they'll give you. But she was also saying it's, it's really not as much of a big deal 
people hype it up to be. Viz Malisa, like, I can't believe I keep saying Jumbo. That's all right. <laughs> well, Jumbo just fly it, rolls off the tongue so much more. Oh, Jumbo are getting so much free publicity this year. They shouldn't have won so many races last year. We've said their name too many times. Yeah, but I mean, Patrick, what should Watt do now? Just ride around Paris yeah. when he recovers after the oh, Giro for the Olympics? Don't no crash again. Probably, probably he never crash. crashes. You can't say that. He never crashes. The uh, cyclocross guys, they, they never... Yeah. Yeah, the, the 2019 tour crash, which was really bad. 2000, what year are we in? Yeah, 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 but, like, that, yeah that, but that's like your point as well. Like, that's pretty impressive that you have to like go all the way back that. Yeah, the guy doesn't hit the deck. Well. Oh, E3. Oh, yeah, yeah but that, that yeah, the gutter crash, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But no, to Jack's point remains, he doesn't crash very often, which is great. I'd say, do, do the Giro, do the Olympics, keep out the same. And then it's like, what do you do after that? Like, yeah, win the World Cup? Win the World Cup. Honestly, would, yeah, honestly, send him to the World Cup. Why not? Why Why, why not? What's he going to win at the World Cup? Why, why is he going to go to the stages? Everything. I think he's never won a World Cup stage, so maybe that's something he wants to take off his list. Wins the stage at the all. Uh, he wins the stage of his year, wins the stage at the World Cup, takes off, winning a stage in every Grand Tour in one fell swoop. Has he done the World Cup before? Has he won a stage in the World Cup? I don't think he has, no. no. I, okay. But, so yeah, just check has he even off. done the World Cup? No, he's never done the Welter or the Giro, just five Tour de France's. Dude, just do it for the vibes. Why not? <laughs> I think he's going to have a great Giro. He's going to have a great Olympics. What is a great Giro for him? He wins the points jersey. I, he won the Mont Ventoux 2 stage and then the the Champs-Élysées <laughs> against Cav in the Tour in 21. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he's going to be contending GC. I don't know. He could win five stages. Yeah, he literally could. But, I mean, speaking of Spain, because you mentioned the Welter, uh, the Tour of Basque Country is coming this week. Jonas Bingo is back in racing, everyone's favorite Dane, and uh, he won last year. How how can you stop Jonas Bingo from winning? <laughs> um, the park horse isn't actually that hard, dare I say. There's no actual hilltop in it anywhere in the whole race, which I think is a big advantage to anybody who is wanting to be Jonas. Starts off with a TT, starts immediately screaming, you to go with me. Although Jonas is very good at a TT, must be said. Or I don't know if they're bringing a shark. I'm not sure if there's a bit down or whatever. Well, that was a whole thing. What did you call it? The shower helmet? The, the shark helmet. The not shower like helmet? Awful, <laughs> yeah. like, like weird thing <laughs> on my head. I mean, shower helmet is funny as well. The shower shark yeah. helmet. Um, I, d- I think, honestly, the way to beat him is do a TT that's at least similar, if not ideally a little bit faster than him. And then just beat him, just roll him for a bit of seconds on every stage, apart from the last one where there's the biggest threat of him doing well because it's lots of repeated climbs and just try and hang on. I think that's a pretty realistic goal for somebody, basically, Rasko, to try and beat him. I haven't seen the profile, so I can't comment on that. I have not looked at the profile yet. I would love to see Jonas versus Remco in more time trials because the the two that come to mind for me, Remco's Giro time trial last year, one of the most incredible time trials I've ever seen. Unbelievable. Like, I, is it, he put whatever. Which one minute? Though? The first, the, the first nine. one, the first one when he smoked Ghana. He, I think he gave forty five seconds or whatever to Ghana, and everyone was like, "Well, we all might as well pack up and go home. This is going to be a boring Giro." And then obviously he got COVID, had to abandon the Giro, and then everybody forgets about that performance. But that was unreal. And then Jonas's time trial in the Tour, where he gave it to Poggy, that like those are some of the two most impressive things I've ever seen on a bike. I'm like, I want to see them go head to head more often because I don't think I don't think you can pick like Remco gets more credit for it, but Jonas is not slow in the time trial. I'd really like to see them go head to head. The weird helmets didn't work though in Torino. Yeah. You could you could say that, but I d I don't think that course was massively suited to Jonas. It's just out flat. Or at least this one in Basque Country is a little bit rolling in areas of it. Yeah, I just don't think there's that many stages that suit Jonas. This race, 
like only the last stage where you can really make a difference, where there's like a 4k, 5k, 9% climb. That's where we could do something, for sure. But all the other ones are quite flat finishes, and they're more suited towards a puncher. So that's why I see it being quite difficult. Or that's why I see it being easier to beat Jonas. There's less terrain that helps him. So I think that it's going to be a really interesting race. And I think that it's not just going to be the big GC players doing it all the time. And we haven't even mentioned Rob. I mean, of course, he capitulated big time in Paranese. So much so that I rescinded his his membership from the Galacticos. <laughs> Looks what we have. But I don't know, Roglic, do we think he can contest Jonas as well? Or do we think that it's literally just Ravko? I think just Remco. I mean, yeah. Jorna has actually held Roglic win the Tour of Basque Country a few years ago where he was man-marking Tarugacha. Yeah, I don't think uh, he's going to... Yeah, I think he's going to put his idol to the sword. I trust Roglic less than yet, less by the year to like execute a decent GC performance. He might be fine at the tour, but I just um, that Paradise is really lingering in my mind to back Roglic for this. I think Jack's right. I think I think it's Ramco who's going to be the only person who could be Jonas in this race. The thing I'm most interested to see is Jonas made such a big step up last year compared to the year before. I want to see if he's now gone up and, like, how close is he with Remco? Like you're saying, like, it's not a course that favors him. Well, if he's contending for that and he stepped up again, and it's like, well, it's going to be a pretty boring Tour de France if he gets a smooth ride there. Like, he was yeah. already the best climber in the world yeah, quite easily by far last year. If he's gone up another level, and like you said, if Roglic hasn't gone up another level... Uh, you know, we just pack up now. End of the season. Well, I don't know because like, has Bora announced their team for the tour? Because they have a lot of guys that are can top five. They have a lot of guys that can podium mm. tour. The guy I read seeing a provisional, but it's a bit of a weird one. It's like Rocklich, Henley, Hindley, Blasto, and then they have like some sprints in there, like Van Poppel's in there. As well, it's like a weird, it's a bit of a weird team. That'll be one of my favorite teams to watch at the tour this year. I really want to see what Bora does. I think so. Here it team. is: Matteo Sobrero, Danny Martinez, Nico Dance, Danny Van Poppel, Alexander Blazov, Jade Hindley, Primoz Roglic, Bob Jungles, and Leonard Kemnet. So that's the long list. That's a good team. I like that. Yeah, it's it's an interesting team for sure. Like Jack said. One to watch mm-hmm. for sure, but yeah, Mancho Vanderpool isn't down on the start line uh, for Tour de France right now. Yeah, I love that happen between now and July. You're saying Jonas has you want to see more evolve as a rider? If he has, I mean, this year at Gran Camino, he was running absolutely riot with everyone, descending crazy as well. I've never seen him descending like that as well, and just seemed to attack any point where it went up. The thing that impressed me the most, like this is. Again, we're not, I'm not talking about recent races here, but one of the things that impressed me the most about Jonas is like his ability just to execute the race so well. Like the thing that impresses me so much about that time trial last year in the Tour de France, I think he had already put like five to eight seconds on Poggy in the first two kilometers, of, like just from corners. Yeah, you're exactly. cornering on it. You like you saw him on rails on these corners. Like just how much he'd study the course clearly to do it is incredible. And Jonas is so scary. He's like, he is a full on GC animal. He is just the person you do not want to be coming up against. Which is why Basque and Jeffing has been so interesting to see him and Remco get, we get a little bit of a gauge at the tour as to how things are shaping up. And I think it is going to be those two who are really going to be fighting out for the victory. I mean, they are even, I mean, I mean, mentioned the user. The user did put time into Jonas in the Terreno time trial. And he's quite fast in the finish. So I think that the user could get a look in as somebody who could get bonus seconds and maybe beat Jonas in the TT. He could be that third person on the podium. And that's probably, that's like, that's kind of like a bit of a long shot for somebody who might be able to beat Jonas. But you so. Yeah. No, Even, I, I think that's that's too much of giving him credit for like 
this is what I really don't like about something is uh, people giving too much credit to young riders for their Aww. potential of what they could become. It is like maybe it. <laughs> Look at the great, yeah, the balloons, I know, right? But like th- this drives me crazy when it's like, in, in my opinion, if we were to stop cycling right now, who is the best cyclist in the world? Matthew Vanderpool, I think. But like, if you look at the results that he actually has, it's Matthew Vanderpool and Pogachar are in a level, like, they are not on the same level as the net. Like, they get grouped in with Wout Van Aert, Pedersen, uh, like, the, this whole other group of guys. Those two, their results are far ahead of everybody else's i think a lot of other guys get given credit for like their potential because they have like similar results but they're three or four years younger and so people just assume they're going to be that much better it's like well vanderpool's actually backed up the results like he actually has been stacking these results for his entire career versus like remember when people were saying and it's terrible what happened to him but what uh people were saying bernal is going to win 10 tours Mm. right like when he won his first tour de france everyone's like he's going to win 10 it's like well okay Maybe, but like, do you keep the, do you actually live up to that potential? Vanderpool actually has. Pogachar actually, I mean, Pogachar, Flanders, Tour de France, like, I don't know anyone else is doing that, but I, I'm very hesitant to give guys too much credit based on perceived p- potential. I mean, third at the, the World Tour as a 20 year old, so amazing, but versus winning or beating Jonas at the Tour. The tour is a different animal, and it's like it's also winning a grand tour. Like I'd give it to Remco first before I so. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's an interesting one. But anyways, we might as well come to our favorite part of the show, and that is rider of the week. And Jack, this is where we choose which rider. I think I already know your rider, uh, who your favorite rider has been, and why. And uh, we can't pick the same rider. That's the only thing. I'm going first. Teo Matteo Jorgensen. <laughs> Why? Uh, like I, I've said it before, but like the guy, I really don't think, <laughs> like this sounds terrible for me to say, but I mean it as the most sincere compliment. I think physiologically he's very average. I think he is an example of somebody that has made the most, average in pro cycling standards, let's put it that way. Like he is a guy that has just made the most out of opportunities, like made the most out of stuff that everybody has access to. I think that's super inspiring. And the guy's so focused. And all the pressure is on his shoulders today. Everybody's looking at him. Like, okay, he's had a great run so far this year, but it's a lot of when he hasn't had the pressure on him and he was the leader of the biggest team in the world this year going into the hardest day of racing of the year. And he lived up to that potential. And like every, forget the final result. Okay, he ran out of legs with 30K to go. He, up until that point, I mean, like that just shows like he has room to get there. He, the, the engine can grow there. He got to that point. He won Glasgow as well, so that that's an extra bonus. Yeah, not bad either. <laughs> that's fun. I think this is, that's not really been that many races. I want to think, I want to think an interesting outside rogue. I think it's just I think Van der Poel's my rider of the week. Uh, just has to be. Okay, yeah. I'm. I'll go for uh, Mozzato because who saw him coming on the podium? Imagine the odds of that. You could retire. Yeah. Good one. That was probably one of the most bizarre results I'd ever seen in like 10 years of watching bike racing. And when I loaded up a result and I saw Mozzato in second album. What has happened in this race that I've not watched? But he's come second. Yeah, I think I spent that. That was a punching above your weight sort of performance. It was awesome, sure. Well, especially because Bling was so well behaved in Milan San Remo, like perfectly straight, didn't close the door on Jasper, and lost the race because he was so well behaved when he probably could have got away with moving a little bit there. And then today, it's like right across the road, and you're like, "Come on, man! <laughs> like this couldn't be more obvious." It wasn't very um, discreet, was it? No. And the best part was, like, right before, <laughs> so right before Scott brought that up, I was just like, "Oh, Jake Olula, I'm going to give them the sportsmanship award for the week because <laughs> they've been so polite. They've been so 
like well behaved in the bunch and everybody says there's no respect in the bunch i'm like i don't know i see it with the jaco guys they seem to be pretty respectful and then boing in the finish just right across the road you're like ah well that kind of killed my argument right there hello echelon cycling podcast this is ewan calling from a rooftop in tirana albania a country where bus timetables seem to be optional Uh, i missed the recording last night it's a very very chaotic trip and albania left me uh, missing the recording for this wonderful ronda van vlander uh, dissection where we saw matthew van der poel dissect the field apologies scott and patrick i'm sure you guys soldiered on without me just like uh, the way that uae soldiered on without today pogacar well, this is my time of the week to give my rider of the week. And for that, I am going to give the prize. Hopefully the other guys haven't chosen him. He's a bit of an obvious choice this week. To Luca Mozzato of Archea BMB. Uh, the Italian was sort of dumped a little bit by the Paracycling Project, which didn't come to fruition two years ago after a strong year where he really proved himself with second place in Trobo Leon. He then sort of had to find his identity at, at his new team. And... Yesterday, he secured his first ever podium at a, like, at, a, at a monument, and it's the first ever Arkea podium at a monument. People weren't expecting this from Mozzato, but he's had a fantastic, uh, fantastic spring so far, and I hope this is a sign of good things to come from our man. So that's everything from me from a rooftop in Tirana, Albania. I'll see you guys next week. But anyways, with that, that's basically episode 62. And hopefully not the last time we see Jack. We'll put Jack's website down below, uh, How to Become a Professional Cyclist, the book, audio book. So check that out. And uh, as always, check uh, Patrick out as well. I'll do cycling, plenty of battle games, hopefully this week coming out. But uh, yeah, with that, that's basically it for us. Uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button and comment down below what you thought of this week. But uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Okay, that's it. Cheers. Thanks. That was really good. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. That was great. I don't know.